All right, we're in Genesis chapter 19. The name of the sermon is Chinese New Year, the year of the rabbit. Now, you may or may not realize this, but the word rabbit was a term for homosexuals in China a few hundred years ago. And so when the Chinese Zodiac originally came out, I'm not saying that that's what they're referring to when they say the year of the rabbit. What I'm using is in a symbolic sense, it truly is the year of the rabbit. It's the year of the homosexuals in 2023. And let me just read this to you before we get started in the sermon. And it says, in the 18th century, there was a book titled The Tale of the Rabbit God. And there, is a, there was a temple created, a, a homosexual rabbit temple, just within the last 20 years. And here's what it says. Tu or Shane, or Tu Shane, is a Chinese deity who manages love and sex between homosexual people. His name literally means rabbit deity. His adherents refer to him as Ta Ye. And it says in 2006, a Taoist priest by the name of Lu Wei Ming founded a temple for Tu or Shane in Yong District in the new Taipei city in Taiwan. Roughly 9,000 gay pilgrims visit the temple each year praying to find a suitable partner. The temple also performs a love ceremony for gay couples at the world's only religious shrine for homosexuals. As of 2020, the temple remains the only extant shrine to the deity. And so in 2006, a temple was created specifically for religious homosexuals. It's their version of Mecca to go to to get married to other guys, to just do whatever manner of perversion. And according to this, right now, it's the only one in the world. I doubt it's going to stay that way, though. I'm pretty sure the way the world is coming, we're going to start having a lot of, you know, gay rabbit temples. And probably a lot of temples that are colored, you know, with a six colored rainbow on them as well. I mean, that's the world that we're coming to. And what I would say is it was the year of the rabbit in Genesis 19 at least in that area. It is certainly the year of the rabbit here in the Philippines in 2023. Point number one is the rise of homosexuality. The rise of homosexuality. Verse one, and there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go in your ways. And they said, nay, but we will abide in the street all night. Now, realize in the story, Lot does not realize these people are angels. He does not know these people. When he first sees them, he thinks they're just visitors to town. And look, it might be a matter of courtesy to say, hey, do you want anything to drink? Do you want something to eat? But Lot goes a step further than you would normally go for a visitor that you don't know. Right. What he says here in verse two is this. He says, enter into your servant's house and tarry all night. Isn't that a strange thing to mention to someone who's a visitor in a town? You don't even know this person. Hey, why don't you just sleep in my house tonight? Isn't that strange? It's not like this is a person saying, hey, I'm also new IFB. He doesn't know this person. And he's like, just stay at my house all night. Why would he say that? Because he understands what Sodom is like. He's saying, basically, get in my house now and stay all night. And it says, and wash your feet and ye shall rise up early and go in your ways. And what he's saying is, while the homos are all still drunk out of their minds, get out of here. Now, he's not saying that very specifically to these people. But we know, reading Genesis 19, verse 2, that is what he's saying. He's saying, wait a minute. We can't let people know that you're here. Come to my house and then early in the morning, it's like, just get out of here, right? That's basically what he's saying here in verse number two. I find it humorous. They say, we will abide in the street all night because that's also not something someone would normally do either. We're just going to sleep in the street, but I think they're trying to make it resonate to Saul and just basically it, it's putting him in fear of what's about to take place. Verse three, and he pressed upon them greatly. And they turned in onto him and entered into his house, and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. So you got a bunch of homosexuals that surround this house, and it says they're old, and it says that they're young. Now, the question is, 
how old is old and how old is young? And the Bible doesn't ex explicitly tell you, but it also says small and great. Okay. Now ask yourself this question. If somebody is, because somebody might say, well, a 16 year old is a young man. Isn't that what somebody would say? But is a 16 year old small? No, they're not. I mean, oftentimes 16 year olds are taller than their, their father. I was taller than my dad when I was a young teenager, right? I mean, honestly, a 12-year-old, they're not that short. I mean, they're, they're probably about 75% of the way that they're going to be. I mean, in my opinion, when we're saying small, we're saying young, I, I think it includes people that are under the age of 10. Now, I could be wrong, but when I'm thinking of small and young, I'm thinking... Very young people. But here's the thing about this, though. What you're seeing is a rise in homosexuality because they're converting young people. Young people. I mean, can you imagine an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old as just a full-blown homosexual? But that's the point it got to in Genesis chapter 19. You're seeing a rise in homosexuality. You know what? You also see a rise in homosexuality in today's world as well. I mean, everybody's going to say, everyone who's an adult, that when they were a child, this is not what it was like in the Philippines. On my drive down here, I got a lot of sermon material from the billboards. And I'm not even including Vice Pongit. Uh, there was a billboard that said, the ultimate drag experience, divine divas, with three guys dressed as women on the drive down here. I'm pretty sure that didn't exist 20 years ago. I mean, there is a rise in homosexuality. They also had an, another billboard. They had this guy who was doing construction work. He had this big paint roller, and it's a six-colored rainbow for his paint roller. I'm like, what in the world? I mean, a construction worker? I mean, but this is the world that we live in, and this is just on the billboards on the drive here today. Okay. We certainly see a rise in homosexuality here in the Philippines. Now go to Matthew 11. Matthew 11. And let me show you some verses that people try to use to, to basically criticize our stance on homosexuality and what the Bible says. It says in Matthew 11, verse 22... But I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of judgment than for you. And thou, Capernaum, which art exalted unto heaven, shall be brought down to hell. For if the mighty works which have been done in thee had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say unto you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for thee. And people use this verse to say, well, see, this is proof. Homosexuals can be saved and homosexuality is no worse than other sin. Look, here's what you need to realize. By the time it got to Genesis 19, it was too late. That's why the angels didn't come to town and say to Lot, hey, you know what, let's do some soul winning. Right. It's like, I'm an angel, I can't get anyone saved, but I'll be your silent partner. Right? It's not like they come to town and do that. They say, get out of here. You say, why? It's too late. Maybe, maybe when Lot first got there, it could have been reached. But by the time of Genesis 19, it can no longer be reached. I mean, it is just a cesspool of filth. It is a very dangerous and very scary place that needs to be destroyed. Okay. But what the Bible is saying is, you know what? If there was soul winning and the word of God being preached, it would have prevented this from taking place. You say, Brother Stucky, I think you're too hard on the homos. Well, maybe I'm trying to protect this place from being a Genesis 19 in 2023. Because if the churches preach like this around the Philippines, you know what? This country would not turn into the mess it's in now. And I'll tell you what, I am not the only preacher who feels this way about the homos. The problem is people feel this way on the inside, but they have no guts to express it on the outside. Go to Matthew 10. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Matthew 10 verse 11. And Matthew 10 is a very famous chapter for being a soul winning chapter. He sends them out two by two. And it says this in verse 11. And into whatsoever city or town ye shall enter, inquire who in it is worthy, and there abide till ye go thence. And when ye come into an house, salute it. 
And if the house be worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it be not worthy, let your peace return to you. And what those verses are indicating is you come to a house, you knock on the door, and by default, you assume that they're worthy to hear the gospel. But if it turns out that they're not worthy, then you don't let the gospel of peace pass upon them, right? So an example is we knock on a door and somebody says, sure, I'd like to listen, but they start arguing with us partway through. It's like, okay, they're not worthy. And then basically it says in verse 14, and whosoever shall not receive you nor hear your words, when ye depart out of the house or city, shake off the dust of your feet. So we go out soul winning, and if somebody's willing to listen, we'll give them the gospel. But if it turns out that they're not willing to listen, we just quit wasting our time. Because every soul winner has run into this where you knock a door and someone's willing to listen, and then partway through it's obvious, oh, actually, they don't really want to listen. They're trying to convert me. I mean, I, when, I don't run into them a lot, but when I run into Ang Da Ting Da An, that's usually what they do. They're willing to listen, but not really. You start talking to them, and it's obvious they're just trying to convert you, and they're not going to believe what the Bible says. Well, if they don't receive the words of God, then just reject them, the Bible says. Verse 15. Verily I say unto you, it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city. And what the Bible is saying in verse 15 is if there is an area that has heard the gospel a lot and had opportunities, they're going to be held more accountable. You say, why? Because at least they had a chance, right? And by the way, what verse 15 also proves is that a person can become a homosexual without hearing a clear presentation of the gospel because it's going to be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah than the one that heard the gospel a lot. See, it's true that in Romans 1, the Bible says someone becomes a reprobate by rejecting truth. It doesn't mean they've heard a complete and full presentation of the gospel. Look, in many countries, people are becoming homosexuals that are never hearing a clear presentation of the gospel. You can't tell me that in Genesis 19, all of those young homosexuals heard a clear presentation of the gospel from Lot. That did not take place. But here's the thing. You're born with the truth of God inside of you. You're born with the belief in God. I mean, nature itself declares God is real and people have a conscience and people can choose to reject the conscience and fight against God or they can decide to accept the truth. And look, a lot of people at a young age, they determine to reject God at a young age, even if they've never heard the gospel. And here's the thing. You know what? If someone never hears the gospel, it's more tolerable for the person for them than the person who heard it a lot but chose to reject it. Now go in your Bible to Ezekiel 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. You say, Brother Seki, are you saying then we got to give these sodomites a clear presentation of the gospel? No, that is not what I'm saying. Because that's not what takes place in Genesis 19. And we'll talk about that at the end of the sermon. What I'm illustrating to you is a person can become a homosexual without hearing a clear presentation of the gospel. They can already reject the truth of God without hearing a clear presentation. What is also true is that if somebody gets inundated with the truth, they're going to have to make a decision either to believe it or reject it. And so in areas where you really hear the gospel a lot, someone's either going to believe it or reject it. But it doesn't mean that you cannot become a homosexual just because you never heard a clear presentation of the gospel. That's not what the Bible teaches in Romans 1. Ezekiel 16, verse 48. Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 48. As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. Now, this is a popular passage people turn to. And they'll say, see, the sin in Genesis 19 is pride. It's not homosexuality. The sin is fullness of bread, abundance of idleness. What Ezekiel 16 is describing is root causes that lead to what Genesis 19 is. It's saying that before you got to this point, 
you had pride. Before you got to this point, you had abundance of idleness, laziness, right? Fullness of bread, laziness, because they didn't really have a whole lot to do. And what happens? Well, if you have too much free time, you get into trouble, right? Those are root causes. But there's no doubt when you read Genesis 19 or what the Bible says in the New Testament about Sodom, it's destroyed because of the homosexuality. Okay, turn in your Bible to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. You see, when I see a country that is really, you know, pro-LGBT like the Philippines is, I mean, in Asia, what's our competition? Thailand? Is that it? Maybe Taiwan. I mean, they got the, the homosexual rabbit god. I mean, we're certainly one of the most pro-LGBT countries in Asia. Talk about a great representation of Christianity. But you know what that teaches me? Obviously, before it got to this point, a problem was pride in this country. Abundance of idleness. That's what the Bible's saying. Those are things that led to that. And here's the thing. I mean, you see an explosion in the United States because a lot of the most high percentage cities in homosexuality are in the United States. And you certainly see pride in the United States. I mean, the big American song, I'm proud to be an American, where at least I know. It's like that's the beginning of the song. And abundance of idleness. Well, you certainly have that because with the welfare system, a lot of people are growing up. They don't have to work jobs. You get paid not to work in the U.S. I mean, literally, if you, if you choose not to work in the U.S., they'll pay you 50,000 pesos a month. Now, that's not as high as it sounds because it doesn't go as far in the U.S., but you, you'll get paid. They'll make sure that you have food. They'll make sure you have a place to stay. I mean, they pay you not to work. What's, what's going to be the result of that? Uh, Genesis 19. And this is happening all over the world where it's turning into a modern-day Sodom and Gomorrah. In the United States, here are some statistics on homosexuality and the LGBT. In 2012... 3.5% of adults identified as LGBT, either lesbian, gay, bisexual, or whatever else is underneath that umbrella, right? 3.5% in 2012. That's one out of 30 people, roughly. 2013, 3.6. 2014, 3.7. 2015, 3.9. 2016, 4.1. 2020, 5.6. 2021, 7.1. I mean, in nine years, it went from 3.5 to 7.1. Now, look, I, I personally, I mean, it's been a few years since I've been to the U.S., but I don't think it's that high. I don't know where exactly they're getting statistics in big cities, maybe. I'm not really sure. I don't think it's that high throughout the United States. But regardless, it's more than double, 3.5 to 7.1 in nine years. That's not just increasing, that's parabolic. Right? For those, I mean, if you remember your math class, that's like a curve, because I mean, a parabola starts off kind of small, doesn't seem like much, and then it's like, whoosh. I mean, if, if that continues, because it's not just increasing, but it's accelerating. It would take less than nine more years to double again based on the rate that it's rapidly growing. And I can't imagine it getting up to 14% by 2030, but I don't know. I would have never guessed the world would have got to this point. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, I mean it, it used to be kind of a debate in the U.S. like 10 years ago. Is there a higher percentage of safe people or homos? I think the debate's over now because they're increasing a lot more rapidly. And it's like, you can't pull out evidence from a few years ago because it's changed a lot in a couple of years. And realize, when you have adults identifying as LGBT, it's not like a lot of people that are 60 years and old and older are LGBT. Which means the ages of 20, 30 is going to be a lot higher than the 7.1. I mean, there is a rise in homosexuality. I did not find the statistics here in the Philippines but I'm sure that it is skyrocketing quite a bit as well. Now, obviously, different areas of the Philippines, it might be higher or lower. I'm sure here in Metro Manila, we're going to have a higher percentage. Same thing in the U.S., big cities, you're going to have a higher percentage of homos. 
but it is increasing everywhere. And what I'm saying is it's the year of the rabbit. I'm saying the Chinese Zodiac got it right. I mean, it's accurate. It is the year of the homosexual. It is a huge rise in homosexuality in 2023. By the way, a lot of people will tell you this. Well, you know what? Homosexuality is not a choice you make. It's biological. Don't a lot of people say that? Well, my question would be, if it's biological, why is there an increase? That doesn't make sense, right? If it's biological, it should just be constant. Now, of course, they'd argue, well, I mean, they have a lot more confidence to come out now. Well, yeah, you could maybe do a 0.2% on that. You're not putting doubling the amount to 7.1. There is a legitimate rise. It's not just people identifying. There is a legitimate rise in percentage. Now, look, I am sure 30 years ago, there were homos that would have been embarrassed to come out here in the Philippines or in the U.S., but I am telling you, there is a huge rise in actual percentage. It's not just people identifying. It's actually realistic. There is a rise. And what that teaches me is it's not biological. But here's the thing. As a Bible-believing Christian, I would have already known that because the Bible shows it's not a biological thing. It's not genetic. It's not just based on, well, you know what? You know, it just happened to be just born a homo. It doesn't work that way. You're born with what the Bible would say are natural desires by nature. And those are not natural or normal desires that a little kid has, right? Point number one, we see a rise in homosexuality. Point two, we see repercussions of homosexuality. A lot of people say, well, Brother Sucky, yeah, there's a rise in homosexuals, but who cares? They don't affect you. I mean, let men dress however they want. Let men get married to men and women to women. Just let them do whatever they want. They're not affecting you. And, and, and here's the thing. As Bible-believing Christians, number one, we should hate all sin. But you know what? If that were actually the case that they didn't affect me, it probably wouldn't bother me so much. But that's not reality. Genesis 19, verse 5. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. Now, it's very obvious from the context of the chapter what it means by that we may know them. But this is something that is a terminology used in the Bible. So oftentimes it will say, know them, indicating a physical, sexual manner. They're not saying, hey, bring the men out to us because we just wanted to shake their hand and say, hey, welcome to Sodom. Right? We got a nice museum over there. That's a pretty nice. Here's a nice place to go with your family. Nice family restaurant. Good atmosphere. Christian hymns in the background. No, no that's not what they're saying when they say that we may know them. What they're saying is they want to molest those men. That's what they're saying. Verse 6. And Lot went out of the door unto them and shut the door after him and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Now, when he says, I pray you, pray is a word that means to ask. And so when you're praying to God, what you're actually doing is asking God for something. Now, when we talk to God, we should always give thanks and praise God in a prayer. But the actual praying is when you're asking for something. So you ask God, God, please help me become a good father. Please, you know, give me boldness to preach the gospel, things such as that. And so what Lot is saying here is, I pray you, he's saying, I'm asking you, don't do something wicked or evil. So obviously when he says that I may know them, a handshake's not wicked or evil, right? right? Now here's the thing, what, when he's saying I pray you, he's asking them, but what he should really be doing is <laughs> praying to God. Right. He should be asking God, saying, God, help me. It's like, I don't know how I got in this mess. I'm in a bad situation here. I mean, this is a disaster. Verse eight. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. So once again, this terminology of known man, this is a physical, sexual manner that he's referring to. Let me, I pray you, bring them out onto you. And do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. 
for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Now look, as, as a father with a young daughter, this is a verse that does not make any sense to me in the Bible. I mean, honestly, I would have trouble believing somebody said this if it weren't the word of God telling us that Lot said this. And of course, all of us feel that way, but especially if you have children, it's like, I mean, the last thing I would do, I mean, I, I might say, do anything that you want to me, but don't touch my kids, right? But I mean, like, you're offering your daughter? It's like, what, what is going on here? This is crazy. Now, this verse teaches us a lot, though. This is, this is never a pleasant sermon to preach. Look, I preach against the LGBT a lot, but honestly, I don't, I don't enjoy preaching it. It's just, you know, it's not just the year of the rabbit over the next 12 months. It's the decade of the rabbit, Right. I mean, the Chinese Zodiac should just every year, year of the rabbit again, year of the rabbit again, because it is the year. It's the decade. It, it's going to be our entire lifetime. I don't see a way back from this. I think it's going to get worse and worse and worse. I see the point of no return. What you're going to find is every country the, around the world is going to embrace the LGBT. This is what's taking place everywhere. But there's a lot we can learn from this verse, even though it's not very pleasant to think about. Number one. Lot is willing to offer his daughters. What that shows you is there's actually no such thing as a homosexual. I say homosexual because people understand that word, but actually every homosexual is actually bisexual. And not even necessarily just bisexual because they're sexually perverse, which can go under a lot of different categories because they were born and when they were young people, they would have had an attraction to other girls. And at some point, they got defiled. But it doesn't mean they no longer have an attraction to any women. And look, this is something the world will teach you. And you know, women will oftentimes, and I don't get this at all as a guy, but a lot of women will want to have like, you know, a homosexual to go shopping with and talk to and relate to. And it's like, I think that's bizarre. But let me just say something, ladies. You're not safe if you're around a homosexual late at night. There's a famous situation in our country a couple years ago. It's like Judges 19 in 2000, whatever year it was, in the last few years. It's like, you're not saying, look, Lot understands this. Now, the reason why he's offering his daughters, he thinks that they might be willing to accept this. And one of the things that he tries to get them to agree to, he says, they haven't known anyone. They haven't been sexually active. So maybe these sodomites would want to defile my daughters because they would take pleasure in destroying the virginity of my daughters is what he's saying. Now, by the way, this is not the daughters that are married, right? People misunderstand this when they read Genesis 19. Obviously, if he lives in the town, he says, my daughters have not known a man. It's like they're married to men. What are you talking about? He had more than two daughters, okay? These ones are virgins. We don't know how, well, at least he claims they're virgins. I personally don't think that's the case, but he either thinks this or he's saying it. Based on the fact of what they do later on in this chapter, I have trouble believing that's their first time, you know. It's, it's a disturbing chapter to talk about, but I'm just saying, he's claiming, well, they're virgins, so maybe you want to defile them or do whatever, but don't do anything to these men. Look, I don't know what the, if you're in this situation, which hopefully none of us ever would be, I don't know what the proper thing to do is in Genesis 19, 19, verse 8, but this is the worst thing you could do. I don't know what you do, but offering your daughters, it's like, Lot's a saved man. This is a saved person. It's like, what is wrong with you? Verse 9, and they said, stand back, and they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. And it's like, you're judging us? I mean, Lot, the Bible says, judge not, right? Now, when it says sojourn, sojourn means to live temporarily. What they're saying is Lot came to live here for a time period. And now he thinks he owns the town. Now he's going to be the preacher in the town and tell us what to do and what not to do. And, you know, out of their own heart, you're seeing what the problem is. They don't like it when people criticize their lifestyle. Look, homos hate all of us, not just me. If you say you believe the Bible and stand up for what the Bible teaches, they will hate you also. And they try to bully you into thinking, well, you got to say that you love them. You got to love everybody. 
That's not what I see in Genesis 19. I mean, the Bible talks about hating people with perfect hatred. There are people that you're supposed to hate because they're vile haters of God. These are not people that you're supposed to love. These are bad people. They're evil people. I mean, look at what they're doing. They're saying, man, we want to rape these people. That doesn't come into the mind of a normal person. But this is the world that we live in in 2023. And it says, he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. I don't know what is worse. I mean, let's be honest, rape and murder. That would be my best guess. I can't really think of what would be worse than just rape. I mean, rape and murder is what it sounds like they're saying. And I'll tell you what, you know, many years ago when our church was protested in Sacramento, I remember just thinking about this chapter and I realized that the only thing that's stopping these sodomites from just attacking us is they're afraid they're going to get in trouble. They're going to get arrested. So they can't get away with it. And I was thinking about, you know what, what would they do if they could get away with it? Uh, Genesis 19. This would happen everywhere. They would force people violently if they could get away with it. Now, this is not normally how they attack young children. But the reason why is because they can't get away with it. But they would do this just like Genesis 19 if they could get away with it. Now, what's going to happen if we come to a world where they can get away with it? And I'll tell you what, in, in America, they go very soft on the punishment for pedophiles. You spend a couple years in jail. And then on your record, it's just like, oh, you know, you're you know, basically guilty of committing this crime. But you get out of jail after a couple years. And here's the thing, when there's such a soft punishment, that's not really a deterrent from them from committing that crime, as we've talked about recently. And it says, now we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. So basically, Lot steps outside, and he's standing here just outside the door, and they're basically shoving Lot against the door and just trying to get inside to attack those people. Point number one, we see a rise in homosexuality. It is the year of the rabbit in 2023, just as it was in Genesis 19. Point two, there are repercussions to homosexuality. See, here's the thing. If it did not affect me, I would not care that much. I have three children. Look, A grown adult is not safe, according to Genesis 19. I mean, do you see that? A grown adult is not safe. I mean, look, it's not a safe thing. I'll I'll give you an example. When when I first visited the Philippines, not the first time I visited, but when we did the first missions trip in 2018, in what was it, April of 2018, right? When When I came here, you know what, my sleep schedule was completely off. Right. Because, you know, what? It, the time difference is really hard to adjust to. And I remember just waking up. It's like two in the morning. And I'm like, man, you know, what do I do? Right. You know, two in the morning. And I wasn't the only one. You know, I go downstairs and there's other people from the U.S. that are also there like, yeah, I couldn't sleep either. Right. But I remember it was like four in the morning one day and I decided just to go out for a walk. Probably not the safest thing in Ermita to do at four in the morning, but hindsight is twenty twenty. I just said, well, you know, if, I, if, I, if I'm going to be a missionary, I'll just kind of walk around, see what the area is like. Man, there are a lot of, of, of bakla out at three and four in the morning. And they're not very shy. To, I mean, I, I walked a little bit because, you know, what, generally you can ask my wife this because I think it drives her crazy sometimes because, you know, her parents live in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. is not the safest place, but I'm usually not really afraid and I'll just kind of walk out for a long distance, get some exercise. I'm not really afraid usually. But I'll be honest, after walking for like 15 minutes, it's like, all right, let's just hurry back to the hotel. Right? Let's just get back inside because, you know, this is not actually a safe place to be. It's like, man, it is a scare. And that's the world that we live in. Another example is, you know, several years ago in San... I, I hate San Francisco. I think it's one of the worst places in this world. But it's simply because of the LGBT. 
That is the only reason why. In Sacramento, it's only a couple hours away from San Francisco. Say, Brother Saki, how many times did you visit San Francisco? Uh, like two or three? Because every single time I visited, it was just situations that you see. And you know what? It, it, it's kind of famous in San Francisco and Oakland by the Bay Area where it's a lot quicker to travel by ship or by boat as opposed to going by car with the traffic. And it's a bit of a tourist thing. So you pay like 300 pesos and some people do it every day for work. But it's kind of a nice thing, right? I mean, it's a beautiful area. And so I remember we went and me and my friend and, you know, we're just on the, on the boat for just like 30 minutes and we were just talking as we normally do. We got joined by a group of about 40 drunk homos. And over half of the people were homos on the boat. And this was right after Golden State won the NBA title, the first time they won it. And I remember this because everybody's dressed in, you know, Golden State gear and a lot of rainbow dressed people as well. And they're on the ship and they're drunk out of their minds. You know, I guess celebrating Golden State's win or whatever. And we're just like, wow, this is great, right? We're just talking normally as we, we normally would. Just in general, not really talking very intensely about the Bible or anything very offensive. And then all of a sudden my friend said, hey, we got to stop. Because all of a sudden they were looking at us, just talking about Christianity and the Bible in general. And look, being around drunk people is not the safest thing. Being around homos is not the safest thing. You put those things, two things together. I mean, it's like mixing Mentos and Coke together. It's like, right? It is not a safe thing. And all of a sudden, he's like, hey, let's go down to the lower deck. Because there were two decks where there's nobody on the lower deck because you want to see what's going on, you know, see outside on the... We just went down to the bottom. It's like, let's just get away from them because who knows? They might try to throw us over or whatever, right? And it's just like, as an adult, you're not safe. How much more a child can't defend themselves against a bunch of homos? But you can defend yourself against one or two or something like that or, or three and get away or whatever, right? What about a child, though? A child can't defend themselves against one, right? I mean, it's a very dangerous place. It's scary enough as a grown adult, right? I mean, look, I'm, I'm a relatively young guy. I feel like I'm strong enough. I could defend myself against someone trying to attack me, but it's still not safe because they go in groups, it's, 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 it's just like the E piece. You see one, that means there's 20. They travel in groups. There's always their pack right there with them, right? Point number three, what is the response to homosexuality? Because there's no doubt there's a rise in it. It's not going away. We got to have an opinion about it in 2023. And there's repercussions. What's our response? Well, first, let's look at God's response. Genesis 19, verse 10. Genesis 19, verse 10. But the men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. So they open up the door and they basically pull Lot in and they shut the door, right? Shut it, deadbolt it, lock it 50 times, whatever you got to do, right? And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great. So there is the reference to small which in my opinion would indicate children under the age of 10, at least some of them. And they're smote with blindness. They can't see. Right now, look, imagine you get smote with blindness, right? Imagine you get something in your eyes. Let's say, you know, there's a, a dust storm. If you've ever had something like this happen and all of a sudden, you know, your eyes hurt, you can't open them, right? A normal person, especially if somebody smites you with blindness, you're going to get out of there. Isn't that what a normal person would do? Notice their reaction. So that they wearied themselves to find the door. They get smote with blindness. And what are they doing? They're really struggling and fighting to try to find the door to get inside. It's like, what? It's crazy. They're insane. It's like, man, it sounds like they're acting like animals. Sounds like they're just like a rabid dog. It's like a dog that needs to be taken out back and shot because it's got rabies. Yeah, I agree. 
It's the point of no return. Right? I mean, that's what you do with an animal when they get something. I mean, when a dog gets rabies, you say, it's too late. You just shoot it, and it's the end of it. Why? Because the family's not safe from that dog. Right? You say, well, Brother Sucky, you know, what's the response? What are you saying? I'm saying, let's look at God's response. First, he strikes him with blindness. Verse 12, and the men said unto Lot, hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place. Because the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. God's response is, it's too late to preach the gospel. It's too late to fix. It's too late to start a church plant here. It's like, just destroy it. Go to Jude 1. Jude 1. You know, the Bible says the cry of them is waxing great before the face of the Lord. And, you know, I don't, I don't know 100% what that's saying. But, you know, the, the, the thing that I think, too, is just a young child that is crying for mercy. And the Bible, and look, I'm not, I'm not trying to say too much because this is not a pleasant thing to think about. But the Bible says in Romans 1 that they're unmerciful. And that's always what pops into my mind when I read Romans 1. And I see Genesis 19 of people crying out for mercy. And you know, the sad thing is many people that are the victims become the person as they grow up because they choose to hate God, but not all of them. It's not like every single person in Sodom had become this, but unfortunately, what are you going to do when you live in that area? I mean, it's too late. I mean, that's, that's what Sodom is going to be like forever. It could have never been fixed. It would have been impossible. What does God say? Well, just destroy it. It's too late. The Bible says in Jude 1, verse 7, Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, which is homosexuality and everything else that they were into, are set forth for an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. So look, this is not the Old Testament in Jude 1, verse 7. It's a New Testament verse that is talking about Genesis 19. And it said, you know what? That serves as an example in many ways. One way is if you get to this point in an area, it just needs to be destroyed. It's too late. You can't reach them anymore, right? It serves as an example because it shows us what these people are like. You say, Brother Stuckey, that's just one story. It serves as an example. So the Bible is saying, you say, but Brother Sucky, I've never seen this take place. I mean, all the homosexuals that I meet are just so nice. They act so friendly. Right? Yeah, it's funny, when, when my wife and I were first starting to talk like eight, nine years ago, you know what? There's a lot of beliefs that I told her. My wife's been an independent Baptist for longer than me, actually. But there's a lot of things that I was showing her and telling her that, you know what, she didn't really agree with because it's not really what they were taught. And one of the things she struggled with is what I was saying about the homosexuals. And one of the reasons why it was hard for her is because she had experience with workers that were homosexuals, people that she knew from college, and they act nice. They act friendly. And then one day she went to ride the jeepney and there was these two homosexuals that were just, they, they, a little kid had gone on the jeepney and they were basically talking about how they could get this kid to trust them. All we got to do is buy him this. And basically, you know, the grooming is the terminology. And my wife was so angry. Like she told me about it afterwards. I can't believe I said, that's what I told you. I was like, I'm not shocked. I wish I was surprised, but I mean, Genesis 19 is an example, and you know what? The same thing happens in our modern day. Look, I wish this weren't true. I wish I would never preach on this again, but I have to because it is the issue of today, one of the big issues. 
And it serves as an example that they're going to be destroyed. You say, well, that's not enough proof. Look, less than 2,000 years ago, there's a famous city called Pompeii. Who started that story? This, the story of Pompeii. And you know what? It was, it was an area that had been kind of largely forgotten because it had been destroyed. And archaeological evidence came up, and they found out, wow, this was like the most pro-LGBT, sexually perverse society that has, has ever lit, existed since Sodom. And it magically got destroyed out of nowhere. And it's, it's not hard as a Bible-believing Christian to figure out why. Because they, it was known as a modern-day Sodom and Gomorrah. Obviously, this was 2,000 years ago, but what I'm saying is modern-day Sodom and Gomorrah 2,000 years ago, and God did not change his mind after the resurrection. Go back to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. So what should our response be as Christians? Genesis 19, verse 12. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides son-in-law and thy sons and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city? Notice this. Bring them out of this place. Get as far away from this as you possibly can. As far away. And that's true for an adult. And it's certainly true for kids. Some of the applications, what about the television? What about the things that you see on TV? Look, you're watching Vice Pongy all the time. He's telling these jokes. He's funny. Ha, ha, ha. You know what? You're going to be brainwashed by the TV. And I'll tell you what, I don't think that person is funny at all. We, we have, my wife has relatives in California, and when we would visit, it's a small house, and Vice Pongin is always on in the background. I'm sorry, but I don't see what's so humorous about the guy. Making sexually perverse jokes, I don't see how that's funny. I've gotten people saved with Vice Pongin on in the background of the TV. I know what the guy is like. I don't see what's funny about it. And I'll tell you what, you're raising your kids. You better make sure you, you don't allow them to see things like that. It's not like all these kids' shows are safe either. I mean, Halloween's just a funny ha-ha joke for young kids also on YouTube. Yeah, no big deal. You better keep your kids away from this stuff or they're going to get brainwashed. How about the music you listen to? I don't know who the famous music people are today. But I'm pretty sure it has not gotten better since when I l listened to rock music a while ago. Or, or how about a real application? Look, I understand this is not possible for all people. But let me just be frankly honest. If you have young children, the school systems are not safe for those young kids. Right. I mean, I wish, because I, I do believe that in the past, you go back 100 years, you could send your kids off from school. They could get an education. It could be safe. It could be okay. And it would, but look, I don't believe that's the case in 2023. Right. It is a dangerous place, especially for young kids. Because I'll tell you what, kids under the age of 10 are very impressionable. Now, I understand not everybody is in a situation where they can completely avoid it. But I'm just saying, if you have that opportunity, bring them out of that place. Right. That's the application that I would make. And you say, Brother Segi, that's really going to hurt me financially. Yeah, I get it. It's hard. I mean, this is the world we live in. It is not a safe place. And I'll tell you what, as an adult, you may be able to withstand this stuff, but what about a young child? They aren't that safe in the world that we live in. Go to Genesis 19. Genesis 19. Actually, turn to Isaiah 58. Sorry, Isaiah 58. I lost my train of thought. Isaiah 58 will close up. By the way, at a young age, teach your children what homosexuals are like. I tell my son, homosexuals are bad people. I mean, I literally tell my son sometimes, because you know, where we live, we do have neighbors that are homos. I said, son, you can't go outside to play right now because the homosexuals are there. They're bad people. 
And I'll tell you what, don't shy away from your kids learning good doctrine and being afraid. Like, you know, we were in Grab the other day, driving by a Catholic church. My son's like, that's a Catholic church. That's a bad church. I was like, you're right. I'm not going to shy away. Look, I want my son to know what the word of God says. And I certainly want them to know, like, hey, you know what? I, I tell him there are bad people that are out there. I'll tell him there are bad people. It's not a safe place. You say, why? Because I want him to know this stuff. Not just, well, let him just get brainwashed for the first 10 years of his life and then teach him what, no, 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 teach him at a young age. We don't need the kids to leave the room for a Genesis 19 sermon. We need them to hear this. You say, why? Because they're not hearing it on TV. They're not hearing it at school. They're not hearing it from Coco Melon or whatever, Bob the Train or whatever. I'm not saying everything's bad on there, but they're not going to learn the good doctrine that the Bible teaches. They need to hear this stuff at a young age from the Word of God. All the preaching is good for us as adults and children. Everything is good for them. And I'll tell you what, kids need to know this at a young age. Look, in America, 50 years ago, they had ads running from the local police that they were warning children, be very careful from being in public because you never know when there might be a homosexual nearby. Look, the police were running ads in Los Angeles. Not some small town, Los Angeles, California, which in our modern day is a cesspool. But they were running ads and warning kids. Why? Because kids are going to be naturally trusting. They're at the park just shooting hoops. Some guy comes over, acts nice, offers them candy, and that's what they're warning the kids about. And now churches are afraid to warn kids. And a lot of people, and look, I'm not the only one that believes this. I promise you there are other Baptist pastors in Metro Manila, and they also believe this. Look, I, I, I sometimes make jokes about the lack of Bible reading from pastors. But look, a lot of Baptist pastors have read Genesis 19. And most Baptist pastors, maybe not the most famous, but most still hold to King James only. So they read it in the King James. They've read Genesis 19. They've read Judges 19. They've read Jude 1 verse 7. They know what the Bible says. But we can't offend someone because our biggest tither, his son, dresses like a girl. That's the reality. You say, Brother Secchi, this sort of preaching is going to turn people away. Well, I guess we'll find out because we are at our second highest attendance ever today, 82. And we're going to see. I mean, if a bunch of people quit the church because they can't stand what I say about the homos, well, I'm glad you got the truth in your last service. Amen. Because it's going to help protect you in life. And what I would encourage everyone is, if you got a problem with what I'm saying or you disagree, read Genesis 19 on your own. Don't look at commentaries online. Read it on your own. Right. Let the Holy Spirit teach you. Read Judges 19 on your own. Look at Jude 1 verse 7 on your own. Read Romans 1 on your own. I mean, we're encouraging you to read the New Testament in the month of January. Read it. Find out for yourself. And you know what? It's amazing because when people read through the Bible for the first time, they always have the same response. Man, you know what? God's a lot harsher than I thought. Right? People read through the Old Testament. It's like, man, people are being killed for various things. And then you read these stories like, wow, it's, it's a lot worse out there. Yeah, because you know what? The Bible says, they that drink, drink in the night. They that commit murder, commit murder in the night. They that do these horrible crimes, they do it in the night, and you're probably not around at night to see it. But this is what the world's actually like. It's worse than you think. Isaiah 58, verse 1. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sins. Brother Seki, why do you preach so much against it? Well, because the Bible says, show my people their transgression. And the house of Jacob, their sins. I mean, it's obviously a major sin in our country. It's it, it, just last week, this week, I think, 
my wife told me, I think it was on Monday or Tuesday, my wife went out and, you know, in, in a lot of schools, you have required school uniform for boys and girls. She's surprised because one of the boys was wearing the girl's uniform. And apparently, you're allowed to dress like a girl now at a lot of these schools. Right. You're allowed to wear the, the school uniform for a girl instead of a boy. And it's probably happening all over Metro Manila as well. And it's just like, wow, this world is changing very quickly. Brother Sagi, why do you preach against it? Well, because it's the transgression here in the Philippines. Right. It's the sin in the Philippines. Now, look, I'm not worried about a saved person going down this road, obviously. But I want us to know what the Bible says. I want you to be able to protect your family. I want you to be able to protect your children. I mean, a lot of people, you know, they get married, they have their first child, and then maybe they'll have the homosexual uncle sound so nice and he wants to babysit so you can go out on a date. And look, this happens all the time. I want people to know what the truth is so you don't have a problem with your kids being defiled by these people. And look, I might be an overprotective parent. You might think that. But you know what? I, I'm more concerned about my kids being safe than anything else. And you know what? We ought to avoid these people, and we ought to preach against it. Now, look, I understand. If you work a secular job, I'm not saying get yourself fired tomorrow, because I promise you, you can get fired if you just say everything that you believe. But at the same time, I would advise you, don't completely shy away from standing up for the truth. If somebody says, hey, you know what, these people are just normal people, don't you agree? No. Right? Avoid these people. And look, honestly, just in my life, I have a lot of stories that I could say, and I'm not going to for sake of time. We need to avoid these people and preach against it. And unfortunately, a Genesis 19 sermon is going to be preached every year, probably several times, because this is the world that we live in. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Thank you for allowing us to be here today and getting to see uh, what the Bible says here in Genesis 19. Help us as saved people to be aware of this sin and the dangers involved, God. Help us not to be afraid or ashamed of the Bible, God. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.